Church would like to invite you to Ridge Kids on Wednesday nights. We have classes for children and youth alike. On Wednesday nights, we have been learning that in order to receive salvation, we must first follow the ABCs. in our children's classes we have been learning how to be soldiers in God's army but we don't fight with our hands we suit up with the armor of God I'm the hell of salvation I am the belt of truth I am the breastplate of righteousness I am the shield of faith I am the shield of faith of the gospel of peace. I am the sword of the spirit. Each Wednesday night in our third through fifth grade class, we ask God to take our heavy rocks, which represent our prayers, and we throw them in a bucket that represents giving a burden to God. We learn how to pray for others and to thank God for the good and the bad things that happen to us. In all of our classes, we have Bible lessons, snacks, play games, make crafts, and help each other understand God's Word. Good morning, church family. Uh, as you can probably tell, I'm a little bit under the weather. Uh, I haven't had a fever for a day and a half or so, but out of an abundance of caution, uh, I decided to pre-record today's sermon um, and stay home uh, so as not to get anyone else sick. I'm really fine. I'm really okay. I'm feeling okay. I just didn't want to take the risk of getting any of you sick, so I apologize that I couldn't be there today. I would ask you to pray for me and my family, but also uh, many of our church family are recovering from COVID and surgeries and things like that. So if you'll help me out by praying for them, also by um, calling to check on them or texting to check on them, uh, let's show love to the body of Christ this week. Uh, we're going to continue in Acts chapter 21 today. Um, I'm really excited about the sermon for today. I think it'll give you some great encouragement and applications, and I hate that I can't be there with you to preach it in person, um, but I'm grateful for Grady to have recorded this on Saturday so I could share it with you anyway. Um, we're going to look at Acts 21 and actually into 22 as well today. Uh, as we've seen over the last few weeks, the Apostle Paul was eager to return to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. In our passage today, we're going to see that he has arrived, but sadly, instead of a restful and worshipful celebration, he's going to be facing persecution. This persecution is the beginning of the last chapters of Acts, so that we're going to see uh, really a condensed view of several years of Paul's ministry uh, where he is imprisoned and facing various different trials, which finally culminates in his execution at the hands of the Roman Empire. So this is a historical story, and it is recorded as such in the book of Acts, which is mostly a historical book. Um, but I do believe that there are some important truths here about spiritual warfare, and that's really the, the angle that I'm going to kind of come at this from, that there are lessons here that we see in Paul's struggles that we can apply to our lives as we walk with Jesus today. And so to begin, I just invite you to read along with me Acts chapter 21, verses 27 down to 32. When the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him in the temple, began to stir up all the crowd and laid hands on him 
crying out, Men of Israel, come to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and this place. And besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with him, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was provoked, and the people rushed together, and taking hold of Paul, they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. While they were seeking to kill him, a report came up to the commander of the Roman cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. At once he took along some soldiers and centurions and ran down to them, and when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. And if it's okay with you, I'm just going to say a word of prayer for you the day before you're hearing this, um, but I believe God answers prayers, um, whether it's on the day or before or after. So let me just pray for you. Lord Jesus, I ask that um, as I'm preaching this today to an empty room, uh, Lord, that even here the Holy Spirit would uh, illuminate the Scriptures for me, give me clarity to speak, uh, especially uh, with the challenges that come in preaching in this format. Um, Lord, it may be even more difficult today to pay attention. It may be even more difficult for me to communicate clearly. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask you that you would teach me as I open this passage of Scripture for our congregation. And Lord, even though I won't be there tomorrow uh, in the flesh, uh, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be doing his job, uh, which is far more important than mine. Lord, I pray you would bless my church family, whom I love and I long for. For those who are sick, I pray you'd bring healing and recovery. Uh, Lord, for those who are struggling in any way, I pray you'd bring comfort and grace. And Lord, I just pray that you would help continue to make us to be the church that you want us to be, the men and women, the boys and girls that you want us to be. Lord Jesus, we love you and we exalt you in your holy name. Amen. The first thing I want to point out to you today in our study in Acts is that we get a snapshot of some of the schemes of the devil here. And if we understand the Bible as we should, then we understand that that there is a spiritual realm, both good spirits and evil spirits, the the good spirits being God and his holy angels, which are ministers for us, the book of Hebrews says. But then there are also fallen angels, and there are bad spirits that, that seek to harm and to devour and to deceive. And we know that we're at war with these people. And so, to be effective in that warfare, it helps us to understand some of the tools that Satan uses. So I want to share with you some of the the schemes of the devil today, and then at the end, I want to show you some of the things that Paul did to stand against those in the strength of the Lord's might. Now, if I were to ask you, what is the most dangerous sins or the most deadly sins, the most wicked of sins, we would probably say things like murder or adultery or rape. And to be clear, those things are devastating. They are deadly. They are wicked, and, and we shouldn't tolerate them in our lives. But, but there are other sins that sometimes we, we, don't, really, we don't really guard against, and, and some sins that we even we participate in without realizing how serious they are. And uh, The first one we're going to look at, this first tactic of the devil is one of those sins that many Christians even don't realize how dangerous it is. It is the the sin of gossip. And I want to show you this again in Acts 21, verse 27. When the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him, Paul, in the temple, began to stir up all the crowd and laid hands on him. Notice that phrase, they began to stir up the crowd. They did this through the sin of gossip. Now, before we go deeper into the sin of gossip, I want to just point out something to you um, that I think is a great little nugget of truth right here in these verses. Notice it was not the Jews in Jerusalem. So, So Paul has gone to Jerusalem to observe the Pentecost festival. And it's not the Jews there that are going to start this riot that starts this persecution of Paul. Notice it was the Jews from Asia. We've seen these guys before in our study of Acts, a couple of places. We saw them in Antioch in Acts chapter 13. They started a persecution of Paul there. We saw them in Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17, and and again in Corinth in Acts 18. There have been Jewish people all over the world that Paul would meet that, that they would begin to cause persecution. Now, they have come to Jerusalem for the same reason that Paul has. They're there to celebrate Pentecost, and when they see Paul in the crowd, they stir up the crowd in Jerusalem to, to harm him and to, to, to even try to kill him. This brings up an important lesson about the way that Satan will attack one of God's children. He loves to have ghosts from our past to do his dirty work. 
You see, we all have skeletons in our closet. We all have things in our past that we are ashamed of. We all have people in our past that knew us before we came to Christ. And we all have our own demons that we face and our own struggles that we face. And and Satan loves to throw our past in our face. This will often be past mistakes or people from our past lives But Satan loves to to deal in the past of where we used to be and who we used to be and what we used to do. But I want to share this with you as an amazing truth of God, something that the Lord taught me several years ago. It's this, that the Holy Spirit will never convict you of any sin that you have already repented and confessed. If you have repented of a sin and confessed it to the Lord Jesus, it is washed by the blood of Jesus. You are forgiven, you are clean, you are made righteous. Now the Holy Spirit will convict you and dog you out until you repent, until you confess. That's part of his job as our helper, as the comforter, he brings conviction upon us. But when you do repent, when you do confess your sin to the Lord, then it is forgiven completely. The psalmist said that God takes our sins as far from the east from the west. Paul says that God is not counting our trespasses against us and that we are new creations in Christ. John the Beloved says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let me tell you, if you're dealing with shame over past mistakes, the only question that matters is, have you repented of those sins? If you haven't, you need to do so today so that you can walk in the peace of Christ. But if you have repented and Satan is throwing those those fiery darts of shame and guilt at you, then you need to rest in the unsearchable and unending grace of Christ. And I just think that's a, a great little lesson that's brought up in this point, but kind of getting back to what is going on with Paul here, I want to just point out another thing that we see about the way that Satan works that Satan loves to stir up crowds. Now, now hear this. The child of God often has to stand only with Jesus in his defense. The child of God often has to go alone other than the Lord. But Satan loves crowds and mobs and riots. And of course, this is a display of cowardice. A, a mature and strong person shouldn't need a whole group of people to, to back them up. But, but Satan loves to stir up a crowd. We see that in our culture today, don't we? That, that the, the culture is all this way. We've got to go this way. And if you disagree with us, then you're just intolerant and you're just a bigot and you're just hateful and you're just this judgmental person. No, the person of God, the man of God, the woman of God often has to go it alone with Jesus only as his friend. But the world is constantly surrounded by echo chambers. Now, I want to share with you, how did, how did these guys stir up the crowd? We're going to see with lies in a second, but the way they do it is through gossip. And I want to share with you a passage in the book of Proverbs that I think is, is one of those things that we need to be aware of, and we need to see it's something we take for granted in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 12 down to 19. There are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to him. So if we want to live a pleasing life to God, we need to pay attention to this list because there's seven things here that God hates that are abominations to him. They may surprise you. Verse 17, haughty eyes, that's arrogance, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil a false witness who utters lies, and look at the last one, and one who spreads strife among brothers. And I would just point out to you, and you can make of this what you will, that the Psalm, uh, Solomon here says that God hates the one who spreads strife among brothers. We have a saying that we often say that I would encourage you to evaluate whether or not it's biblical that, that God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. Here in Proverbs, God's Word tells us that God hates the one, He hates the person that does the spreading of gossip who causes strife among brothers. And you can make of that what you will, but I just think it's an important warning to us to understand that God takes very seriously the sin of gossip. We often minimize it. We often think it's not that big of a thing. Sometimes we even try to sanctify it by by doing it as if it's some kind of prayer request or as if it's some kind of common good. But gossip is definitely 
devastating, and it is a favorite tool of the devil. It is something that God hates, and it causes division and harm, and we should hate it too. So that begs the question, what is gossip? Well, at its worst, it's what these people are doing in Acts 21. They're trying to stir up hatred, hatred towards someone else. They are trying to stir someone in a negative direction to think negatively about someone else. But at its best case scenario, this is a definition that I was taught in seminary. It's, it's talking about an issue with someone who is not part of the problem or its solution. Gossip is talking about an issue with someone who's not part of the problem or its solution. It's one thing to seek counsel. We need that at times. We need to go to wise and godly people in our life and say, I'm dealing with this situation and I need you to give me some advice. But biblically, here's the thing. If you have an issue with your brother or your sister, you're to go to them and address that issue with them. What we love to do in modern Christianity is to deal with the issue with everybody but the person we have an issue with. And that becomes gossip. We need to be careful that we don't slander others behind their backs because that causes division. It ca- Maybe you've had someone in your family, certainly we all have seen this happen in the church, where people go around in the shadows and they cause division and they, they stir up people. Beloved, that's not of God, that's of the devil, and we need to be very careful of that. And if I can just encourage you one more thing before we move on, is if someone gossips to you, I encourage you to lovingly correct them. Encourage them to speak to the person that they have an issue with and not others. Encourage them to understand the deadly consequences of the sin of gossip. Help them understand that you cannot accomplish God's end with Satan's tools. And gossip is something that belongs to the devil. And can I encourage you one last thing, to do what I call golden gossip. If you're going to speak about someone behind their back, go and bless them to others. Encourage people and tell, tell people how much you appreciate other people. That's a great thing, and that can really help our church, help your family, can help your relationships in general. Go back to Acts 21 with me. We'll see the second tool of the devil. Gossip is one of his favorite tools, but his ultimate favorite tool is lying. Lies and deception are his number one tool. Look again at Acts 21, verses 27 down to 29. When the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing Paul in the temple, began to stir up all the crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, now listen to what they say, men of Israel, come to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and this place. And besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with him, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple." These people stir up the crowd, and what they say is not even true. If we could just kind of make a bullet point list of the accusations as Luke records them here, he basically they basically are saying that Paul is preaching against a few things. First, he's preaching against our people, meaning that he is preaching against the nation of Israel. When you when you look at Paul's life, And when you read Paul's words, which we have many of in the New Testament, you see that Paul had a sincere love for the people of Israel. That is why, even after he had been treated so badly by many Jews, every time he went to a new city, the first place he went was to the the, um, synagogue so that he could share the gospel with the Jews. Listen to his heart in Romans 9, verse 3. This is the Apostle Paul writing. Now listen to what he says, for I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Do you see what Paul is saying there? He's saying, if I, if I could choose between me being separated from Christ and, and the people of Israel being in Christ and being saved, that's what I would choose. I would cut myself off so that they, the people of, of Israel could be the people of God through Christ. This was not a man who hated Israel. This was not a man who preached against Israel. This was a man who begged and pleaded Israel to come to the Messiah that they had awaited for. This is a man that used the Old Testament scriptures that he loved to point out that the Messiah they were waiting for had already come, and his name was Jesus. Secondly, they accused Paul of preaching against the law, the law being the Old Testament, what the, what the Jewish people held as we hold as divine scriptures. Here again, this is an outright law. This is what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. 
The law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. So, so Paul doesn't disregard the law. No, he says now the law has its final fulfillment that it points us to Christ. Far from being worthless, far from being unnecessary, the law is the very foundation on which the gospel is built. Everything in the Old Testament, Paul would say, it, it points us to the reality of Jesus. So it isn't that we don't need the law. The law affects Christians differently, sure. We're not under the Old Covenant, but the law, he says, is a tutor that leads us to Christ. Especially for Jewish people, the law was foundational for them to come to an understanding of the gospel and the Messiah. So Paul isn't preaching against the law. The next thing they say is that he preaches against the temple. That he's, he's insulting the, the place of God where worship is supposed to be. Well, in the verses previous to this, we see that as Paul readies himself for the Pentecost uh, celebration, he actually goes above and beyond to show that he still is trying to be obedient to the law and, and respect the temple. He goes through a purification uh, ceremony where he shaves his head, he and his friends, to show we're dedicated to doing worship properly according to the way the Jews understand it. He wasn't preaching against the temple, but he also understood that the ultimate temple, the ultimate indwelling of God's presence, wasn't a building any longer, but it was the person of Jesus Christ. And then lastly, they just say something that's based off of an assumption that he brought Greeks into the temple. Now, the temple was segmented where you had different places of different size for worship. The the main place was the, the court of the Jews, and that's where Jewish men could go to worship. They also had the court of the women, which was a smaller area to the side where women obviously would go. But they also had a place called the court of the Gentiles. And and that's where if a Gentile had come into the Jewish faith, what was called a proselyte, they could worship. But but they they were very far from the presence of God. Well, verse 29 of Acts 21 says that they had seen Paul with this man Trophimus, who was from Ephesus, and they assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Now, let me tell you, Satan can get, you, can get people all upset about things that are not even true. Pa- the, Paul had not brought this Greek person into the temple. They just assumed it. He was just guilty by association. You see, Satan loves lying. In fact, John 8, verse 44, this is what Jesus says. Talking to the religious leaders, maybe some of the same religious leaders that are going to try to have Paul killed here soon. John 8, 44, Jesus says this, You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now, Jesus here is addressing Jewish religious leaders, maybe some of the same people that are going to persecute Paul in this story. And notice that Jesus tells them that they are like their father, the devil. Satan is the father of lies, so all liars are acting as his children. Let me tell you what, no child of God can be an unrepentant liar because lies are the tools of the devil. We need to understand that we can't use Satan's tools to accomplish God's purposes. Someone that lives an unrepentant, lying life is showing by their nature that they are sons or daughters of the evil one. Just like a child of God will reflect the nature of God by the fruit of the Spirit, so too will a non-Christian, a non-believer, show that their true father is the devil in the way that they live, by lying and deceiving. Before we move on, I just want to ask you today, Are there lies that you are believing today? Lies about God. Lies about His Word. Lies about the church. Lies about yourself. And let me just pick on that last one for a moment. If you think that you are worthless, insignificant, broken beyond repair, unforgivable, etc., You've believed lies about yourself. More importantly, you've believed lies about the gospel and about God himself. And you need to repent. You need to come into the light and find your identity, not in the lies of the devil, but in the truth of God. What does God say about you? Oh, the Bible makes it very clear that we are, we are sinners and we deserve God's wrath. That's true. 
The Bible makes it clear that we are cursed by the penalty of our sin. That's true, but the Bible also says that God loves you, that God has prepared a way for you to know Him through, the, through His Son, Jesus Christ. And if you are in Christ, that you are a new creation. The old is gone. Now, Satan may bring up your past, and Satan may lie about you, And Satan may try to fill your head with all kinds of lies about who God is and about who you are, but you need to find the truth of God about who you are and who he is from his word. A pastor friend of mine, he used to tell me this, that if you want to know when Satan is lying, all you have to do is say, is his lips moving? Because everything he says is a lie. In fact, Jesus says he's the father of lies. You see, everything that the devil ever does is a poor man's imitation of something that God has already done except for lying. Satan invented that. And so when you see lies, whether it be in politics or in the culture or in the church, you know that Satan is working through his people because the children of light don't live in deception. Back in Acts chapter 21, we see another favorite tool of Satan is violence. Look at Acts 21 verses 30 down to 32. Then all the city was provoked, and the people rushed together, and taking hold of Paul, they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. While they were seeking to kill him, a report came up to the commander of the Roman cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. At once he took along some soldiers and centurions and ran down to them, and when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. I'm not going to linger here very long, but I'll just tell you this. If gossip and lies aren't enough to thwart a child of God, you can count on the devil escalating to violence. People in the flesh only understand violence. In John 15, Jesus is giving his farewell address to the apostles before he goes to the cross. It's, it's my favorite chapter in the whole Bible. John 15, 18 through 20, and this is what Jesus says. If the world hates you, You know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Now listen to what Jesus says. Remember the word that I said to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Now, we have been very insulated from this particular tactic of the devil in the day in which we live, in the country that we live. But most of God's people throughout church history have not been insulated from violence. Many of our brothers and sisters around the world today are in prison or have been beaten, and many have even lost their lives because Satan, what he cannot take by deception and cunning, tries to eliminate by force. The people of God, we don't fight in physical battles. We don't fight against flesh and blood, Paul says in Ephesians 6. We fight against spiritual beings. And so violence is really of no use to us. Go back to Acts 21. I want to look briefly at the final tactic here. You always know the devil's involved when there is confusion. We saw in the end of verse 31 that all Jerusalem was in confusion. I want to keep going in verses 33 down to 34. Then the commander came up and took hold of him, that's Paul, and ordered him to be bound with two chains, and he began asking who he was and what he had done. But among the crowd, some were shouting one thing and some another, and when he could not find out the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. I want you just to keep in mind what has happened so far. These Jews from Asia have stirred up the crowd with gossip and lies, and now this crowd, based on things that aren't even true, are just fomenting in in chaotic confusion. The, The commander comes, and he's trying to figure out who is who, and what did this guy do that's worth this uproar, and and you can't even get a clear answer because one group is saying this and another group is saying that, and they're just shouting over one another. And the Bible tells us that God is not the author of confusion. Uh, we see the same kind of mentality in modern politics where if you can't, if you can't debate your point and, and make a case for what you believe, you just begin to shout over each other. Chaos is a tool of the devil. Now, I want to end our sermon today by looking at what Paul does 
that gives us some inclination of what we should do when we are going through spiritual attacks. How do we deal with gossip and slander and lies and violence and confusion? How do we deal with these things when Satan brings them against us? Well, uh, Paul gives us some great insights here. Maybe not every possible uh, tactic that we have as God's people to endure such things, but some good ones nonetheless. And really the point is this, that we have to fight in the strength of the Lord. That's what Ephesians 6, the armor of God passage says, is that we, we fight in the strength of the Lord. We don't fight in our own strength. The first thing that we need to remember, and it seems so contradictory to our flesh, is that when we are being persecuted, lied about, slandered, that our response as the people of God should be to walk in gentleness. We don't, we don't fight fire with fire. We don't say, hey, if you can lie about me, I can lie about you. If you can slander me, I can slander you. No, we walk in a way that honors Christ, even when the world doesn't play by those same rules. I want to show you a couple of great ways that we see this in Paul's response here. Look at Acts 21, verse 40, and then we're going to go into chapter 22 down to verse 2. Before this, Paul basically asks the commander, can I speak to the crowd? And verse 40 picks that up. When he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the stairs, motioned to the people with his hand. And when there was a great hush, he spoke to them in the Hebrew dialect, saying, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet. And he goes on, we'll look at what he says in a minute. The first way that he shows gentleness to them is notice that he speaks to them in the Hebrew dialect. We see that in verse 40 of chapter 21. We also see that in verse 2 of chapter 22. The response that when they heard him speaking in Hebrew was that they, they became even more quieter. Now this may seem, uh, it may not be that big of a deal to us, but just verses previous to this, Paul began to speak Greek to the Roman commander. The Roman commander assumed that he was an Egyptian criminal but when he began to speak Greek, he said, I think I got the wrong guy. The, Luke is pointing out here a language shift. Now, why does he do this? Paul speaks to them in their own language. This, in my mind, is a proverbial olive branch. He's saying, I too am a Hebrew. I'm one of you. But notice the way he addresses them in chapter 22, verse 1. Imagine you had an angry crowd that was just beating you. They want you to be killed for things that are completely false. If I were Paul, I would be indignant. I would be angry. I would be ready to defend myself and tear them down. Look at what Paul does in verse 1 of 22, how he refers to them, brethren and fathers. Do you feel the love and the respect in those terms? I want to tell you, I don't think I would have that kind of approach to these people in this situation. I think I would have some terms in my mind, but they wouldn't be respectful. They wouldn't be loving. They wouldn't be gentle. I want to go to the book of James real quick. James chapter 3. If you find the book of Hebrews, it's right to the right. James chapter 3, verse 13 down to 18. James chapter 3, verse 13 says this. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. Now listen. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. Keep going to verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. James here makes this great argument that there's two types of wisdom. One is really wisdom, the other is foolishness, but he uses that term almost sarcastically. Verse 14, he says, if you've got bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, don't lie to yourself and say that comes from God. That comes, what he says, not from above, but it's earthly, natural, 
demonic. He goes on to say in verse 16 that where there's jealousy and selfish ambition, every disorder and every evil thing comes out of it. He compares that to the wisdom that you get from God, the wisdom that you get from the Holy Spirit. In verse 17, I want to just read it again. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. You cannot fight in spiritual warfare by using Satan's weapons. And you might say, well, pastor, it's not fair because they can lie about me and they can slander me and they can get violent with me. Yes, I know. And it may not be fair. But the Christian life is not about just getting what we think we deserve. It's about glorifying Christ here on earth. In American culture, we have this idea that the for a man especially to be strong, it means that if someone yells at you, you yell at them back. If someone insults you, you insult them worse. If someone hits you, you hit them harder. I want to tell you, biblical masculinity, biblical maturity, biblical wisdom is not about how hard you can hit somebody, how, how hard you can knock someone down. It's about how hard you can get knocked down and still show grace and kindness and compassion. Now, don't misunderstand me. I believe that there is a time to defend yourself. I, I believe if someone breaks into your home tonight, you have a right and a responsibility responsibility to protect innocent life where you can. But Paul in Acts, he's being persecuted for the case of Christ. The way he speaks, the way he acts is going to have a much bigger impact than just whether he's being treated fairly or not. Because it's going to, it's going to tell the crowd things about Jesus. We need to keep that in mind when we live amongst people. The way of the world is violence. The way of Christ is gentleness. So my encouragement to you, especially to you men, is if there's any way possible to be gentle and kind and gracious, do it. And if at the end of doing that to the utmost, that's no longer an option, then we trust God to give us guidance in that. But but the, the rule of Christ is to show grace and gentleness and compassion. Go back to Acts 22. The second thing that Paul did that we need to do in times of spiritual warfare is we need to remember our testimony. As Paul's gotten the crowd's attention, he begins to tell them his testimony. Since most of us are familiar with Paul's testimony, I'll simply summarize it here very quickly what he goes through in the following verses. In verse 3, he talks about his upbringing, his education under the rabbi Gamaliel and his zeal for the Jewish religion. Gamaliel was, uh, was a rabbi of, of high respect and regard, and to be his student meant a lot for Paul, that he was, he was a good student. He was smart and faithful. In verses 4 and 5, he talks about how his zeal led him to persecute the way. That's the New Testament term for the followers of Jesus. This persecution ends with Paul going to the city of Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished, Luke writes. In verse 5, we know that story. In verses 6 to 11, he talks about his radical encounter with the resurrected Christ that left him blind and helpless. In verses 12 down to 16, he talks about how a man named Ananias came to to Paul on God's behalf. Paul's sight was restored. He He became a Christian and was baptized. In verse 17 down to 21, Paul talks about how God warned him that the Jews would not receive his testimony. As a result, Paul was going to have to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Now, earlier in this message, I shared with you that Satan will often try to shame us with our past mistakes. What's the defense to that tactic of the devil? It's the power of the gospel, the power of our testimony. Paul had more than made some mistakes. He was trying to eradicate the church. He was responsible for the persecution of Jesus' people. Yet he was able to say, I'm not who I used to be because I had a radical encounter with Jesus that changed everything. If you are in Christ today, you too can say that you are a different person because Jesus has changed everything. In fact, that's, that's where we get this beautiful passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'd like you to turn in your Bible to see it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. These are words that many of you are familiar with. 
But I want you to think about this in light of the fact that we have an enemy and we have people in our life and our own flesh that will bring up things from our past to shame us or guilt trip us or to convince us that God couldn't love us or forgive us or use us. Look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Verse 18, now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And he goes on from there, and I'll just stop there. Basically, there's two huge ideas in these couple of verses. Number one, anyone in Christ has become a new person. The old things are dead and gone. And don't miss the second thing is that everyone in Christ also has a new purpose. We are to be ambassadors of reconciliation, Paul goes on to say. That is, we are to help others find the gospel. Others have a radical encounter with Jesus so that they too can say, I'm not who I used to be. Let me tell you what, Satan will dig up every ounce of dirt he can find on you. And he will make up, if he can't find anything, he'll make up lies against you. What is going to get you to weather that storm? of the guilt and the shame and the lies that you face, it's the gospel. It's to understand that though you, Paul would say, I'm the chief of all sinners, but he also understood that he wasn't who he used to be. And by the grace of Christ, he had been reconciled to God and his sins were forgiven and he was clean. And so when, when your heart condemns you, as First John talks about, when the world condemns you, when the children of the enemy bring up your past and your shame and your guilt, you can take them and say, look, I have made some huge missteps in my life. I have done some terrible things, and I am ashamed of those things. But you know what? Christ has forgiven me, and I'm not who I used to be. The last thing that Paul shows us here, and I love this, is you need to remember your citizenship. Now, I gave you a summary of Paul's talk here, but basically it goes like this. The crowd listened to Paul until he mentioned that God had sent him to the Gentiles. That was a big no-no to them. The Gentiles were subpar, subhuman even. So God sending the, him to go to the Gentiles was you know, just blasphemy in their minds. Now look at how they respond in Acts 22, verses 23 and 24. And as they were crying out, that's the crowd, and throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, stating that he would be examined by scourging so that he might find out the reason why they were shouting against him that way. I want to just pause here for a second. Verse 23, imagine this crowd of grown men and women taking off their outer garments, throwing dust up in the air. They're just throwing a tantrum. They're just throwing a fit. And the commander says, I know how to get to the end of this. And being a good Roman soldier, he was just kind of, let's not beat around the bush. Let's just flog the guy and he'll tell us the truth. If we just beat the stuffing out of him, no trial, no, no, you know, here's a glass of water and let me be good cop. It's just, let's beat him. But there's a problem with this, this approach because Paul is a Roman citizen. We'll see that in verses 25 down to 28. But when they stretched Paul out with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and told him, saying, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman. The commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, Yes. Verse 28, The commander answered, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. And Paul said, But I was actually born a citizen. Now, this may not make sense to us, but just to say it this way, it was illegal to punish a Roman citizen without a fair trial first. In fact, if you did that, you would be uh, liable to go through the same penalty that you had, uh, even death, you could be punished for the crime of beating a person without a trial if they were a Roman citizen. And as Paul is about to be tortured, he plays his citizenship card. You see, to be a Roman citizen came with all kinds of, of benefits, tax breaks, and military protection, and legal protection. Notice what happens. The commander comes down to him, and he wants to know, is it, are you really a Roman? And Paul says, yeah, I really am. And look at what he says. He said, I, I became a Roman citizen, the commander, by a large sum of money. He had to kind of bribe his way into being a Roman citizen. Paul says, well, I was actually born a Roman citizen. 
in that sense, his citizenship is actually kind of a greater benefit than the Roman commander who's about to beat him. And as I prepared for today's lesson, it reminded me of what Paul writes in the book of Philippians chapter 3. If you'll look at that with me, our last passage, Philippians chapter 3, verse 18, down to 21. One of, most likely, one of the last books that Paul is going to write in his lifetime. He most likely wrote it in prison after the events of what we're looking at today in Acts. Look at Philippians chapter 3, 18, down to 21. Verse 18, For many walk, of whom I often told you and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. Now look at verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. If we look at these four verses in pairs, We see verse 18 and 19 describe people that are not walking with Jesus. Verse 18, Paul says that he even weeps of those people. He he calls them enemies of the cross of Christ. Verse 19 shows us their end. Their end is destruction. Verse 19 also tells us what their motive in life is. It says that their, their God is their appetite appetite here, meaning that they, they're just in it for whatever pleases them. They're just, they're just trying to fill whatever they can with whatever they can, whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. These are all ways that Paul describes a lost person. But then in verses 20 and 21, he shifts and he starts talking about a believer. Notice what he says, for our citizenship is in heaven. We're not like those enemies of the cross of Christ, he says. We have a different citizenship. We have a different kingdom that we belong to. We have the different benefits that that they don't have. Their end is destruction. What's our end? Look at verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Their end is destruction. Our end is redemption. Their God is their appetite. Our God is the Lord Jesus Christ. Their glory is in their shame. Our glory is in the finished work of Jesus. Their minds are set on earthly things. Our minds are set on heavenly things because that's really where we belong. And look at verse 21. That Jesus will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. We, we talked about this a few Wednesday nights ago about what our heavenly bodies will be like. And I want to tell you, the Bible makes it pretty clear that nobody really understands exactly what that's going to look like, exactly how that's going to be. What we do know, what 20, verse 21 tells us, is that Jesus is going to transform our body into conformity with the body of his glory. John says that when we see him, we don't know what we'll be like, but when we see him, we'll be like him. You say, how can I weather the storms of life? People are bad-mouthing me. They're slandering me. People are lying about me. And believe it or not, if they could, the world would be violent with us already. There's chaos and there's confusion. How do I endure that? Beloved, you remember where you belong you remember that this is not your primary residence. We are pilgrims traveling through life on earth. But our citizenship is in heaven. And all of the benefits and the perks, all of the expectation of what's to come, that's how when you're like Paul and you're strapped about to get flogged and you throw your citizenship card and you say, no, 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 I'm a child of the king. I'm under his protection. I'm under his provision. I'm a citizen of heaven. Church family, I'm praying for you. I hope you have a great day. Uh, Please pray for me. Please know that I am okay. Um, And I'm sure I'll be feeling better soon. Y'all have a great day. God bless you. Amazing love, how can it be? 
that you, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, oh, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you in all 